Have you ever wondered where you really stand with God? Are you overcome with feelings of guilt because of things you've done wrong? Are you tired of religion that focuses on rules that you can't keep? Have we got good news for you? It's time to listen in on some casual conversation with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski and discover what true freedom is all about. This is Growing in Grace. It's all about you. That's what the gospel is. Yeah, it's all about you and what you do and living right and being more dedicated. Yeah. And reading the Bible more, going to church more, praying more, and striving, confessing anything. Struggling. Wrong thought. Wrong action. April Fool's. I mean, that's what the gospel is, right? Well, if you go to some churches, that's the case, but not around here. <laughs> Welcome to Growing in Grace, Mike Kapler with Joel Brzezinski. Hey, Joel. Whew, you had me worried for a second. Oof. As I was saying that stuff, I had myself worried. <laughs> it brought me back to those days. <laughs> I know. How did we do that all those years? Yeah, I was commenting to someone just the other day that I think that some people really do believe, and and, and this is sad, but it, it's understandable just through what is taught in churches today, but some people really do believe that the Christian life or life in Christ is meant to be a struggle. We're meant to strive and struggle, and it's meant to be just this hard thing. But Jesus said just the opposite. He said that if it's a struggle for you, if life is a struggle for you, if you're weary and heavy burdened, come to me. He said, he didn't say, I'm going to give you more of a struggle. He said, I'm going to give you rest. That's why Jesus came, to give us rest. He came to give us rest from religion, rest from struggling and striving to keep ourselves right with God. He came as, what we're going to talk about this week a little bit, the covenant. He was the covenant that God gave. Under the old covenant, it was a covenant that God made with the people, and the people had to keep that covenant. If God had a covenant with me, God would certainly do his part, but I would fail at doing my part, and so the covenant would fail. And that's the old covenant. It failed because the people could not keep their end of the bargain. So the new covenant was God making a covenant with himself. He made an oath to himself, so it's not dependent on us and our promises and our deeds, but it's dependent on God keeping his promise. And guess what? God never breaks his promises. He never lies. He never breaks his promises. He never breaks his oath. And so in this new covenant, we have this grace guarantee, as you call it in your book. We have this guarantee that we're okay with God. He loves us. He cherishes us. He cares for us. And he did everything. He did all the work for us to be secure in him. All we do is believe it and uh, receive his goodness. I guess that's why they call it a not only a new, but a, a better covenant, and it's been established upon better promises. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it came through the, the word of the promise or the word of the oath. God made a, a promise or a word of the oath. Our high priest, Jesus, was appointed by that word, not by the law like the former priests were. The guarantee is Jesus Christ. He is the new covenant. Uh, the book of Isaiah prophesied, uh, speaking of Jesus, I will give you, God will give you, I will give you as a covenant for the people and as a light for the Gentiles. How about that? If you've missed the last couple of weeks, you might want to go back and find out what we've been talking about with the Gentiles, which we're going to do again here in just a minute. But that's Jesus. He, he is the new covenant. We're not in covenant with God. He didn't make the covenant with us. That's why we have a guarantee. Hebrews 7.22 in the NASB says Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. He is the surety of that covenant. That's why this whole thing is good news. That list of stuff I was throwing out at you about our dedication and our commitment. Um, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be committed and dedicated and wanting to uh, to do things to please God. I, I don't see anything wrong with that in and of itself. The problem is and that becomes the foundation for your belief system. Then you're getting into uh, what the Jews were under in the first covenant, which brings me, Joel, to Acts chapter 15, because over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how the ministry of Jesus was really more pointed at the Israelites to show them who were under the law that they needed to find a different way than that law. They couldn't get to where they wanted to go through that law. It wouldn't provide them with what they needed with righteousness or life. It couldn't be done. That was the bad news. And they were trapped in that system. They were married to that law. And Jesus was going to get them out of it. But first he had to show them their inability to keep that law. 
as you were talking about before, uh, he came to close their mouths and to stop their boasting in themselves. And so uh, when Jesus said some things like keep the commandments, hey, Jesus, uh, hand in the crowd, right? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. What does the law say? Well, it says, you know, this and that. Eh, good answer. Okay, go do that. Try it. Let me know how it works out for you, by the way. And yet we've turned some of these things, these red letter verses, verses out of context. We've turned them into Christian teaching, and it contradicts many other things in the Bible. For example, and this is what I wanted to get to, Joel. I feel like I'm taking up a lot of time here, but Acts 15, the apostles and the elders came together at the church in Jerusalem. And by the way, many of these were former Pharisees who came to believe and the word came back to these elders and leaders at the Jerusalem church from the apostles out there, like Peter and Paul and Barnabas and others. The word came back to the church that Gentiles, non-Jewish people were getting saved, which was also prophesied, as we mentioned earlier, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, that this would happen. And, and Jesus was trying to say the same thing to the apostles before he left. He was explaining how all nations would come into it. wasn't just going to be limited to Israel anymore. This was going to be a whole new covenant, a whole different covenant. And, and so they said, hey, the Gentiles are experiencing faith. They're coming to understand grace and, and receiving this gift of life, uh, you know, apart from works. And God is doing fantastic things among the Gentiles. And this kind of had the elders and the, and the leadership at the Jerusalem church scratching their heads like, wow. This is very interesting. We think that they should be circumcised and directed to observe the law of Moses. Well, the apostles argued their case that that should not be what should happen. And Peter, of all people, stood up and said, hey, why do you want to put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of these new converts, these Gentiles, why do you want to place a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear all of these many thousands of years? this yoke of bondage known as the law, why do we want to put that on their neck? We couldn't handle it either. Why do we want to give it to them? We believe that they are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as we are also. So there was some silence, and James heard both sides, from the Pharisee side to the apostle side, and he stood up and gave an opinion, a judgment. He says, it's my opinion, my judgment, that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but then he went on to say they should abstain from things contaminated by idols and a few other things. He listed four things as seen through the eyes of the law. So we just negotiated 613 different rules and statutes from the law down to four. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make, Joel, is that even James gave an opinion and, and agreed with the apostles, essentially, that the law should not be placed upon the Gentiles. They should be freed from it. What he didn't realize yet at that time was that the Jews should also be free <laughs> from it. Everybody came together as one into the body of Christ after Jesus broke down the law uh, and the commandments. He broke down that dividing wall, that barrier, as Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. So when you see some of this stuff that Jesus is saying to Jewish people under the law and trying to turn it into a Christian teaching, you're ignoring some of this other stuff that Paul wrote in his epistles and something like this in Acts chapter 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that stuff always used to confuse me. I, I didn't understand why Jesus would say, you know the commandments, keep the commandments and, and you'll live. You know, what must I do to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. Those who do good will have eternal life. He would say things like that. And then Paul would say things like, well, no flesh is justified by the deeds of the law. He would say, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, you know, who does not do the works of the law, basically, or who does not try to work his own way into salvation, to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And so Paul would say certain things, and Jesus would say other things. And like you're saying in this in Acts 15, there were people who were saying that, well, they need to be keep they need to keep the law. And then James came up with this little list of four things. And I'm like, who's right? I don't understand this. And it wasn't until I began to understand that, like we were talking about the last week or two. Jesus had a ministry to those who were under the law, not to Christians. I mean, yes, indeed, Jesus died so that we could believe and that we could have eternal life by grace through faith, but that ministry, when he was 
preaching law, when he was teaching law, when he was teaching, yes, uh, so what must I do to be saved? Well, keep the commandments. That was for the purpose of showing those people, whoever would come to him with their list of works that they had done, these things I've kept since my youth, what do I lack? He would show those people that, the thing is, he didn't come out and say this. He didn't come out and say, now look, you've brought me your list of things that you could do. Now look, haven't you seen that you can't do that? So now you just need to turn to me in faith. Jesus didn't come out and say it that way. He let them go off. He let the rich young ruler go away sad. And maybe later on, sometime later, maybe the rich young ruler thought about all this and realized, I can't do this. And he came to faith instead of trying to establish his own righteousness by what he did. But Paul said it plainly. Paul said that if it's by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Paul said it plainly. Paul talked about the gospel in plain and simple words, whereas Jesus kind of, he didn't necessarily say everything as plainly as Paul. He kind of let the people go away and think and realize that they can't do this by themselves. So anyway, when you see these words of Jesus and the words of Paul, these words from Acts, and they confuse you, remember there was a purpose for each thing, and it had to do with Jesus preaching law to those under the law, and then Paul and others showing us plainly that there is no justification by law. It all must be by faith. You mentioned earlier, Joel, about when Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, you know, come to me and, and find rest. And yet so many Christians struggle with thinking that the Christian life is, is meant to be a burdensome thing, a hard thing, a challenging thing. It's not meant to be that way. The reason sometimes they come to the conclusion of that is because they look at other things Jesus said, like what we've been talking about, sell everything you have, give it away. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Carry your cross daily. You can't be my disciple unless you give up everything. Leave your father, leave your mother, and on and on. What's the difference? The difference is beginning to understand that a lot of the time Jesus was ministering under the first covenant to Israeli people under the law, trying to show them the impossibility of becoming just like him and becoming perfect through what they were able to do through that law. And there were other times, maybe not as often, but it's there. And you just referred to one of them where Jesus would look ahead to the new covenant. And, and they were su- there was such a contrast there, such a clash. So understanding some of the things that Jesus said, we don't discard them. We don't throw them away. We don't get rid of them. We, right. There's a story to be told here. And so it's fascinating to look back and see how all of this unfolded, but understanding that when what may look like a contradiction from time to time in the scriptures, it's just simply gaining a a better understanding that there were two different covenants in play at different times. Well, with that, uh, one more week to go on the Summarizing the Scripture series. Next week, we'll summarize the Summarizing the Scripture series, (laughs) taking a look back at the last 16 weeks of conversation that we've had here on the podcast. So stay close for that next week, right here on Growing in Grace at growingingrace.org. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. To access hundreds of past programs, visit graceroots.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.